Okay, amen. Well, let's open up to chapter 8. You might recall from last time that we, um, that's some sort of allergies. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, you may recall from last time we looked at the uh, persecution. We've seen a number of I don't want to call them small, but they're they're minor compared to what's coming here uh, in this book. But we've seen persecutions against the church, against the apostles. We see what broke out last week uh, in chapter 7 against Stephen. Now you recall, uh, if we go back to chapter 6 for a moment, recall that uh, there was this problem with the Grecian widows who felt that they were being overlooked in the daily distribution to the widows. They felt that the uh, the Hebraic widows were actually being shown favoritism by by um, by the church. And so that, that concern came to the apostles, and the apostles gave instruction to the church to select seven men who were full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, who were of good reputation, and to select those men to take care of food distribution. And, uh, and we see that the seven who were selected actually have Grecian names. So they all came from this Grecian Jewish background, with the exception of one who was Grecian, but he was actually a, um, the one who uh, was Gentile in the first place and had converted to Judaism and now was a, a member of the body of Christ as well. But in any event, uh, of those seven names that we read, two in particular stand out to us. One was Stephen, who we saw last week, who is full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. We see this young man who has incredible wisdom. And when the persecution begins by this one particular uh, synagogue called the Synagogue of the Libertines, it does appear that Saul, who we know of as Paul, but his original name was Saul, uh, had come from this region, Cilicia, and, and this synagogue was from there, that he may well have been uh, one of the instigators of of the problems that came against Stephen from that synagogue. Um, he's, he's basically called on the carpet in front of the Sanhedrin, and he's called to give an account uh, to, to counter these, uh, these false accusations that have been raised against him. And what he does, it's just an incredible chapter if you if, if you missed last week please go back at least read it but if you go through the study hopefully you'll see a few other things. And we see uh, how that ends up. Uh, he, for, of course, you know, he, he gives up his life. He's stoned to death. And he sees Christ himself standing at the right hand of the Father there to welcome him into heaven as he dies. And, um, of course, now tonight we're going to see this other one. The, the two who stand out to us are Stephen, of course, and then this one Philip. Now, there's also another Philip who is an apostle, but that's not who we're referring to here. The Philip that we see here is one of those seven deacons who was selected back in chapter 6. So, um, so without much further ado, uh, why don't we take a look at this? We will, look, again, we'll look at chapter 8 in two parts. Um, and so we'll, we'll go through, Lord willing, the first 25 verses this week. But I would encourage you, please read thoroughly the rest of the chapter. And, and wherever you have notes, wherever you have uh, Bible or references in your Bible, look some of these things up. Look up who is this Ethiopian treasurer uh, who comes and he works for this one called Candace. Who is Candace? Look up some of these things on your own. It's worth your while to do this. Um, I think there are some things here that... Uh, I find quite intriguing to see what, what God is doing behind the scenes. We have a tendency to read the Bible without thinking about what's going on behind the scenes. It's always good, and one of the, um, one of the, one of the real suggestions, really even in Bible teaching, is to try to put yourself in the sandals of, of the characters that we're reading here, because you'll see that you're just like them. We really are just like them, and they're just like us. They're just people. Uh, so, all right, well, uh, we will start to work through this at this point. Um, it, it's important to remember this. I'll get on with it, don't worry. Uh, but, but it's important to remember that when, when this was written, in this case, when Luke wrote this scroll that we call the Acts, or the Acts of the Apostles, it's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit, when he wrote this, he... Uh, he didn't write it with chapter breaks. He didn't write it as, well, that's chapter one. Now I'm going to write chapter two. He didn't do any of that. He just wrote. 
the chapter breaks are actually put in during the 12th century. I mean, this is written in the first century. So 1,100 years, give or take, 1,100 years after Luke penned this, that's when certain scholars, biblical scholars back in the church, began to put chapter breaks just and verses later on after that. First there were chapter breaks, and then many years after that, verse divisions. And it makes it easier then to, uh, to find your way through the scripture. I say that because as we end chapter 7, we go into chapter 8, and, uh, and, and there's still information in chapter 8 that really connects with chapter 7. So it, it may help us, in order to see the flow, let's read here what, what is told us beginning in, uh, let's see, Acts 7, let's begin in verse 58. Okay, let's begin in verse 58 of chapter 7. Uh, we read then, you know, this is Stephen now. Uh, he's made his address to the Sanhedrin, this august body of 71 um, really important dudes who were made up of two primary parties, the, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. We read here uh, that um, they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. We have introduction here to uh, one of the chief persecutors. Uh, don't, don't think that he's just some junior over on the side. He's probably the same age. We, we, we assume that he was born around the same time Jesus would have been. So Jesus would have been probably 34 by this time. So Paul is about in his mid-30s, we'll assume. Um, I mean, he's not an old sage, he's not in his 50s or 60s, but he's a, he's a pretty important dude already, and he was probably the, the instigator behind the, you know, the, the attack that came against Stephen, the false accusation. So they, they laid down their clothes, their cloaks, their coats, if you would, at the feet of a young man named Saul, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down, in other words, he fell because of the, the stoning, and he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, it says he fell asleep. Uh, that's a euphemism for the Christian dying. When he said this, he, he fell asleep. And we read, and now Saul was consenting to his death. Okay, there's our introduction now into, into chapter 8. Saul is consenting. He, he cast his vote is the point. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. It's very important to remember that. Uh, later on, this is probably more information than any of us need, but later on uh, we'll get this sense, and many of you may have it already, that since we never read of a, a wife, Paul having a wife, that maybe he never was married. But one of the rules, Talmud tells us very clearly, that you couldn't be a member of the Sanhedrin unless you were married. So he must have been married, whether his wife had died, or perhaps after he he was saved, after he was converted, um, maybe his wife left him, maybe she wanted nothing to do with him. There are a lot of different possibilities, but the scripture is silent on that. But um, in any event, he must have been married at the time. Uh, they laid their feet at the... the at the feet of a young man named Saul, Saul was consenting. He was, in, he, he was voting for, he was in agreement with uh, the persecution of Stephen and the death of Stephen. So we have our introduction to this one who's going to become, uh, obviously he's at this point one of the main instruments the devil is using to persecute the church. We read lots of things, I'll go into those in a moment, but lots of things about what he did to the church before he was saved. But we're going to find this is the man that God uses as one of his primary instruments, and you might say the primary instrument during the first century, to bring the gospel to the world. So we get this introduction to this man, and, and the first introduction that we have of him, frankly, is, is negative. Uh, we see him uh, aiding and abetting the ones who want to kill Stephen, obviously, who, those who want to persecute the church. Uh, he takes a lead role in seeking to destroy anybody who's, who's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, we use the term Christians. They weren't actually called Christians at that time. They were called followers of the way. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. They're not called Christians until later on. Um, 
So, in any event, um, we read, uh, let's read those first couple verses, and then we're going to spend a little time here before we go further. Now Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. And at that time, a great persecution, there was persecution before that, this is a great persecution, arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. In other words, everybody else was scattered, but the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, and they made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc, or he wreaked havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. He wreaked havoc. And the idea, if you kind of follow the imagery in the Greek, it was like a wild boar goes crazy. That's kind of what he was. He was insane. He was insane. He was out to destroy the church. And if you've ever known anybody who was really against Jesus Christ, uh, I can't say that I was necessarily that, although some people may 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 say that I was at that time. Uh, but uh, there's a madness that comes over people. When I, when I was an atheist, I hated Christians. I really didn't care about Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims. I didn't care about them. I thought everybody was a little nuts. But Christians? Man, did I hate Christians. Why? It's irrational. I didn't have a reason for it. But the devil was using me, right? And so here's this one who is... Think of how brilliant Saul is. The Apostle Paul, I know I've said this many times before, I'm not the only one who says this, but, but Saul had to have been one of the most brilliant men that the world has ever seen. Um, if I can grab this book here without causing all my, my other books to fall. I, I know I've mentioned this to you before, but uh, Paul the Apostle by Robert T. Boyd. I highly recommend this book. Uh, I believe that you'll... You'd love the book. It's uh, one of those great reference works that, you know, some people feel sometimes like, man, I need all these letters after my name just to understand what somebody's writing here. Uh, it's not like that. Boyd's book is great. It's very straightforward. It's the kind of book I like, and it has pictures in it. That's also one of the things I like. Uh, I, I love archaeology. Uh, that's part of the reason I like to go to Israel, and I've been to Greece. Uh, I like that because I can see the things. I can see what's left of, of, of the buildings and, and all from, from ancient times. And to be able to see some of the pictures of the places where Paul went. And anyhow, highly recommend it. And Paul had to have been one of the most brilliant intellects. And he was an intellectual. He was a Bible scholar. But he could speak on every man's level. And, and I love that about Paul. And I think that's one of the things that each one of us, if you're, if you're one who can teach the Bible, that ought to be one of our goals, is to be able to teach so that every common person can just understand what this is about. Okay, so um, we read a couple things. We read there, verse 3 again, he wreaked havoc in the church. Like a wild boar, he's going from house to house, hailing men and women and committing them to prison. Think about what he was doing here. By his own admission, uh, Paul said that he persecuted the church. We read in uh, Acts 22, verse 4, says that he bound and delivered to prison men and women. He made sure they were bound and delivered over to prison because they were Jews who were following this so-called Messiah. We know him as Messiah. You know, Christ is the the anglicized English word or the, the anglicized Greek word for uh, for the Hebrew word Mashiach, Messiah um, and of course the Jews in those days did not believe that that Jesus was Messiah uh, but but those who were followers of the way of course did and here was Paul incensed and he was out to destroy all these. So he bound them, he delivered them over to, to prison, responsible for their deaths. He even says this, and we'll get to Acts 26, and at this rate, probably three years from now, um, when he tells King Agrippa, he says, he says, and you know that many of the saints I, I locked into prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them and I punished them often in every synagogue and I compelled them to blaspheme like at sword point to deny Christ 
and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. He says this in, uh, to the Corinthians. He says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, and I'm not, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He writes this to the Galatians. He says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, he says, You've heard of my former life in the Jews' religion, how be, that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God, and I wasted it. I, I did everything possible to destroy the church of God. He even writes uh, to the Philippians when he's giving his, uh, his resume, right, his pedigree, of all the things that he had going for him, a student of Gamaliel, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day. He says, as it, as it concerns righteousness, flawless, blameless in the law. Have you ever thought about the things he's writing there? Could you say these things? Blameless. He says, concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. You know, he talks about all of these things. This great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem, and they and they were scattered. This great opposition, this great persecution. You know, it's been within the city up until this point. You know, against Peter, against Peter and John, against you know various people at different times. But now it's coming against the entire church. It's churchwide. It's not only aimed at the leaders, it's aimed at any any person who's a follower of the Messiah Jesus. You know, we know persecution has occurred throughout the last 2,000 years. Hopefully you know persecution is happening today. What none of us like to talk about is that persecution is happening already here in our country. But it's going to grow. Most of us who experience anything, sometimes we call it persecution, and it's really not, especially if we were to compare what we go through to what our brothers and sisters in some other countries go through. Um, but there's been much persecution throughout throughout this time. Um, you know, we tend to think that you know uh, it's nice when the church is accepted. We want those in government to accept us. We want those in government to listen to what we have to say. And sadly. I mean, I just have to say, why should they listen? We really do need to take it seriously that uh, Jesus said, if they, if they rejected me, they're going to reject you. Jesus said, beware when all men speak well of you. In other words, if, if we're not being persecuted, if we're not being hated, maybe it's because our testimony isn't worth much. Maybe we're not really speaking up. He said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. So, you know, I think it's correct to assume that, you know, that, that Stephen, who was uh, disputing with the members of the Libertines, they're called the freedmen, you know, uh, that, that, that had been a member of that synagogue, he was really uh, debating against Saul. I mean, so it's young man against young man there. Um, in fact, it, Paul, Paul Saul, I, I go back and forth in his name, he was, uh, he was tough to deal with. He was a hated man because he hated the church. And so when, when Paul gets saved, we read this in, in chapter 9 of, of Acts, uh, those in Damascus, you know, when, when God tells this one Ananias, not the same one that we saw who died back in chapter 5, but when this one who's a believer in Damascus and God speaks to him and, and says to Ananias, now go over to this house where, where Saul is. Uh, he's a chosen vessel of mine. I want you to go lay on hands. He'll receive the Holy Spirit. And Ananias says, uh, Lord, I think you got the wrong guy. Um, you know, this, this guy, Saul, he's a bad actor. He, he persecutes the church. He's, you know, he's caused people to die. And, and, you know, maybe you should send Peter. He didn't say that, but I'm sure that kind of thing might have gone through his mind, right? And, and the Lord says, no, go. He's a chosen vessel of mine. I'm going to use him. And, and, of course, those in the church in Damascus say, this man has done terrible things to our people. Uh, when, when, when Paul will come to Jerusalem later on, everybody knows his reputation. And it's actually Barnabas who introduces him to the apostles and says, no, listen to this man. He really, he's the real deal. So, um, 
in any event, we get this introduction to, to Saul. And at this time, we read in, in verse 1, there was this great persecution that breaks out against the church, right? So first of all, there had been the Sadducees. The Sadducees had been this one, we call them a political party, but a religious political party who, they're like the liberals, or we, you might call them materialists. Uh, they didn't believe in eternal life. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in, in spirits at all. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And so uh, they, were, they, they, they were most concerned with how much money can I make? How much stuff can, uh, can I accumulate in this life? Maybe you know people like that. Uh, and those are the things that they were concerned about the most. Those are the ones really who, who initiated most of the persecution early on against the church. And now the Pharisees are starting to step in. We see that at the end of chapter 7. They laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. He's a Pharisee. And the Pharisees, of course, um, were more conservative. We see them as legalists, and they were in many ways, uh, but they cared more about the, the word of God, certainly, than, than the Sadducees did. Uh, and, and they become a, a major part now in the persecution against the church. And because of this persecution, many believers, and I guess we'd say most of, of the Christian believers in, in Jerusalem, are forced to leave Jerusalem. And, and so we, we hate this idea. Come on, I mean, when we talk about persecution, we don't like the idea of persecution. We don't like to talk about the idea of persecution. We, we really don't, because what's going to happen? It's bad stuff. It's hard stuff. There's no question about that. Here's the question. Does God really keep his word? Romans 8.28, how many times do we repeat that? That God causes all things to work together for the good, for those who love God and are the called according to his purposes. Oh, yes, of course that's true. Is it true when it applies to you? Is it true when persecution happens? I mean, when persecution happens to you, to me. See, this is where we really do need to start thinking about this because I, I believe with all my heart that just as the scripture is clear and Jesus has told us that persecution will come against us, we're living in the day when it's really starting to pick up in a country that's never thought we would see real persecution against Christians. But he says right there in Romans 8, 28, that, that God will bring good out of the evil intentions of those who, who brought persecution against us in the first place. I mean, think about it. You're, you're a believer. You're living in Jerusalem. Exciting things are going on in Jerusalem. God's on the move in their fellowship. And, and no one would want to leave that kind of an environment. There's security. There's comfort there in the church. But God's going to use this persecution He's going to use this persecution to scatter the believers out of Jerusalem and like salt, to, be, to scatter them like salt from a salt shaker around the world, specifically into what we would call phases two and three. Remember, Jesus said, Acts chapter one, verse eight, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and we've seen that for the first seven chapters, haven't we? In Jerusalem, in all Judea, that's like the region outside of Jerusalem, and Samaria, that's the region beyond Judea, within the confines of, of Israel, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Wow. See, so we're opening up, God's opening up the, what we call the second and third phases of, of the, the, the movement of the gospel here by using this persecution. No, God's not the author of the persecution, but he's going to use it. Think of Satan, who's out to destroy the church. He's going to crush them. And every time he goes to, to punch them hard, all he does is scatter them further, and the gospel keeps going forward. It says the gospel was preached now into Judea and Samaria. When we think of preaching, we think preacher, preaching needs preachers. You're the preacher. Each one of us is a preacher. Our job is to proclaim, that's what the word means, to proclaim the truth to others by not just what we say, but the way in which we live. People need to see the gospel in us as much as they, at least as much as they hear the gospel come from our lips.
And so, so we see this happening here, and, and we see this young man, Saul, or Paul, as a major part of, of this. And now the apostles are going to remain in Jerusalem. As for Saul, he made great havoc of the church, right? He made great havoc of the church. He dra dragged off men and women uh, to, to prison. And those who were scattered went everywhere, what? Preaching the word. Saul's persecution. Think of it. Saul's intention was to do what Satan wanted to do, to destroy the church. He saw it as an aberration. He saw it as cancer that had come into, in, into the, the, the spiritual leadership and into the truth of Judaism. And he had to rid Judaism of this false teaching as he saw it. But his persecution led to the scattering of these Christian believers. And they now brought the truth to people living all the way out into Judea and then on out from there into Samaria. Jesus said, be, pre be prepared. We read in, in, in John chapter 16, he said, they're going to put you out of the synagogues. In fact, he said, yes, there's a time coming that whoever kills you will think he's doing God the service. That's Paul. That's what he was doing. He says in Matthew 24, he says, they will deliver you up to be afflicted and they will kill you. Many of our brothers and sisters are being killed right now. I would say hundreds of millions have been killed for the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ. And you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Stephen was the first one to give his life that way. And now Philip, we see, is one who's scattered. He's one of those who were scattered. They were scattered abroad preaching the word. That's what we read there. This persecution is far from destroying the church, yet it's going to cause the church to actually to grow. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. And of course, I think you remember Samaria. Uh, Samaria, if you go back into the Old Testament, 721 B.C., um, Sennacherib comes in from Assyria, and, and he destroys Samaria, and he takes tens and tens of thousands of, of these Jews who were, um, they were in idolatry. And God uses Assyria as his instrument to take these idolatrous uh, Jews away from, from Samaria, there had been the division in the kingdom. There was the true religion that, or worship that was going on in Jerusalem to the south, and there was this false worship under the name of Judaism that was going on in the north. And, and so God uses Assyria to come in and to take all these Jews out of um, the north and to bring them from Samaria and to bring them out and distribute them cast them out into the nations. They began to have problems. The wild animals began to, to take over in the north and, and, and the pagans who had come in to replace the Jews, they didn't know what to do. See, in those days, uh, pagans believed, still, still today in some places, pagans believe that um, gods are local, gods are geographic, and so their gods couldn't control the wild animals. They said, we need some Jews in here. We need some, some priests who understand how this God works. And so Samaria sends some of these priests, these are false priests from the past, but he sends them back in and, and they show the people how to worship Yahweh, but of course they do it the wrong way. And now you have these group of people who are called the Samaritans. In other words, these pagans come in and intermarry with the Jews who were there. So Samaritans were half breeds right? They, were, they had Jewish blood, but they also had Gentile blood in them. And from that point, for the next seven centuries, there's this hatred of Samaritans because they're, they're half-breeds. And, and there was an argument. Uh, is, the, is the place to worship, is the place to worship God on, uh, uh, on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, or is the place to worship God on Gerizim? In, in Samaria. We see this question come up in, in, in John chapter 4 where Jesus goes through Samaria and he meets the woman at the well and he begins to tell her some things and she begins to realize that he knows things about her that no one should know and so she changes the topic and so I perceive that you're a, a prophet and she said our fathers uh, said that we should worship on this mountain but you Jews say we should worship on that mountain. What's the truth? And Jesus begins to explain that to her. 
And of course she, she goes back and she tells all the Samaritans, come see a man who's told me everything that I've ever done. Could this be Messiah? And of course they come and they, they, they worship him. And you have, uh, the reason I'm going through all this is the seeds were planted there. Many were saved. Seeds were planted there. And now as Philip goes into Samaria, he's coming for the harvest. God's sending him for the harvest. Many are going to be harvested to come to Christ at this time. It's an exciting time. It's important that we understand this. And, um, but it's also understand, important for us to understand this persecution aspect. I mean, there's a lot of persecution going on in the world today. I mean, I just, um, in fact, I just read an article uh, this morning that in China right now, China uh, removed crosses from over 5,000 churches just in the last six weeks or so. Uh, China has, actually, this is one I just read this morning, that um, China has made it clear for any low-income um, person, if they're collecting, uh, you know, any kind of support, monthly stipend from the government, we would call it welfare in our society, uh, they're going to lose that income if they continue to call themselves Christians. If they read the Bible, if they put a cross up on their wall, they'll lose that. There's persecution. Great persecution is really heating up in China right now. It was bad before. It's getting worse. China is on the list of the top 50 nations uh, that persecute Christians. It's actually number 23 on the list. Number one, of course, is, is North Korea. I'll give you a couple. North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Iran, India, Libya, Pakistan, Eritrea, Sudan, Yemen. Uh, you know, so these are some pretty bad places uh, when it comes to persecution. China is definitely on the world watch list of, of the dangerous countries for Christians to live. Um, so, in any event, so they're, they're scattered around the world at this time because of this persecution. We hate the idea of persecution, you and me. We don't want to hurt. We don't want to see our loved ones hurt. And yet God uses persecution for the furtherance of the gospel. You're going to have to make your decision at some point where you stand on this topic because persecution is coming either way where will you stand when it happens so we're in this next phase of of uh, god's plan to bring uh, the gospel to the nations and and philip now we read verse five that he went down to the city of samaria and he preached messiah jesus to them and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things that were spoken by philip hearing and seeing the miracles which he did they heard him speak the truth they watched the miracles here's not an apostle here's a man full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, a man of good reputation, miracles are following him. He's not using miracles and then finding a verse in the Bible to support what he did. It's nothing like that. God is on the move. God does work miracles. Let him work the miracles. Give your life to Christ. I'm speaking to Christians right now. Be sure to give your life to Christ follow him and you'll see miracles you'll see things done and he said in in these in these miracles it says in verse 7 that unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who had been possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed and there was great joy in that city can you imagine and maybe you can imagine maybe you've experienced some of these things when you were saved uh, i know what it was like when i was saved when renee was saved great joy because the burden of our life was lifted. The, the guilt and shame as a result of, of just terrible living. Just wrong living. Immorality. Drugs. Alcohol. The terrible things that I'd been doing and that Renee had. Uh, you know, she can speak for herself. But, uh, but, but the great joy in knowing that I was loved by God. That my sins now were forgiven. Incredible incredible joy and we saw God on the move in many many ways yeah and so uh, there was great joy in that city and uh, we're not gonna have much time to do this so I'm just gonna kind of read through and make a couple comments we're gonna have to close soon but um, but it is important and you should you should take a look at this man for yourself um, verse 8 but there was a certain man named Simon who previously practiced sorcery. He practiced witchcraft. 
maybe you'd call him a warlock. He practiced witchcraft. So sad in our society today. No, I should say, in our church, the church today. How many Christians just don't get this? You know, there are those Christians who um, act like the devil doesn't even exist. And then there are those who act like his press agent. They're always talking about him. There has to be balance in this, this matter of evil, in this matter of understanding that we have a real adversary. And, and he uses people who give their lives to him. And they, they practice sorcery. I've known people like this. Maybe you have too. This man, Simon, Simon Magus, they call him, uh, who previously practiced sorcery in the city, and he astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed. They listened to this guy from the least to the greatest. And they said, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he'd astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. Think of the power this man had. He had power until everybody started getting saved. But when they believed Philip, see, they believed what Philip had to say. They received Christ as their savior. When they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized, water baptism. They believed and they were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and he was amazed seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. Before we go any further, some of you may know the rest of the story. Let's understand something. Some people want to think, based upon what we read next, that Simon really wasn't a true believer except that the verb that's used for believing there is the very same word that we read where others believed, right? They gave heed, they gave themselves, their, their hearts were open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, it's the same word, uh, the God so loved the world that he, whosoever, uh, that, God so, I, know, I know this verse very well, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, same word, Whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Simon believed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. Now, incidentally, you've got to remember something. This is important. It's important that we remember that Jews hated Samaritans and Samaritans hated Jews. They really did. So what happened? What happened on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the believers in the upper room? What was the sign to, to the apostles that this was happening? Right? The sound of a great rushing wind and, and all those, all those believers began to speak in other languages known languages, declaring the, 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 the wondrous works of God, right? Isn't that what happened? Exactly. Now, the apostles in Jerusalem heard that something was shaken in, in Samaria. Now, that's a big deal, because if you're a Jew, Judaism, J Jerusalem centered Judaism is the only way. And those in Samaria, they're out there. I mean, they believed in the first five books of Moses, but they had a bunch of other things they believed after that. Incidentally, there are Samaritans still today. Uh, I was uh, a couple times uh, in uh, 2012, and then just this uh, January, I was in Israel, and um, a friend of mine took me up to Samaria, uh, to um, up on one side of Mount Gerizim, and there are Samaritans who live there. Some say there's only 200. Uh, the guy I was with says there's actually 500 who worship. They actually um, they offer up sacrifices at Passover because they see themselves as Jews, but also as Samaritans. And there's still that tension between Jews and Samaritans. Anyhow, um, so, so Peter and John were sent to the Samaritans. For as yet, the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, they were water baptized. All right? And no one can come to Christ unless the Holy Spirit draws us. Isn't that true? When did the apostles receive the empowering of the Holy Spirit? When did the Holy Spirit come upon them? Pentecost. How long was that? That was seven weeks after the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? Okay. But it was 
the night of the resurrection that Jesus breathed on the apostles and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So they received the Holy Spirit, but the empowerment of the Spirit came upon them later. I've experienced that in my life. I know I believed and I received the Holy Spirit, but I can distinctly remember one particular point where I received, if you want to call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but the empowerment of the Holy Ghost, I remember when, when I received that. And so uh, it says, verse 17, that they laid hands on those believers and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, oh, Simon, he offered them money. He wanted to buy this. By the way, magicians do this all the time. Buying a, a trick, buying some, you know, process from another magician. He wanted to buy this. He said, sirs, give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. If all, it's just a matter of laying on hands. I'll pay for this. I want that power. Right? He wanted it for himself. Peter's quick to get right at him. Peter said, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Question, was Simon a believer? See, we want to infer that he wasn't, but I don't think you can infer that. He was just wrong. And Peter, Peter definitely chastised him for that, right? But Peter says, repent of this wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven to you. For I see that you're poisoned by bitterness and you're bound by iniquity. How did Simon answer? Did Simon say, you know, let me tell you what you can do? No, he didn't do that at all. Simon seems to be sincere. And that's only my opinion. You have to seek this out for yourself. He said, pray to the Lord for me. He said to Peter and John. Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things of which you have spoken may come upon me. I'm a Christian. I want the right thing. And so when they testified and they preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Here's the question. Why did Simon, what, what was it that he wanted? He wanted the power to be able to lay on hands so that people could receive the Holy Spirit. How did he know they were receiving the Holy Spirit? If Peter just said, we're laying on hands, now you receive the Holy Spirit, and nothing happened, how would anybody know that they had received the Holy Spirit? See, some of us have come from such very cool church backgrounds that we don't want to get into the messiness of spontaneous speaking in tongues and, and miracles. The reality is, just like the day of Pentecost, I would suggest to you, just like the day of Pentecost, here now with the Samaritans. What does God want to show the, the, the Jews, the apostles who are Jewish, coming from Jerusalem? He wants to show them that the Samaritans are saved just as much as these purebred, if you will, purebred Jews who trust Christ, right? And how did the purebred Jews who trusted Christ, how did they respond or react when they received the empowerment of the Holy Spirit? Right? There was, there was, suddenly they're speaking in other languages, right? There had to be something like that that was happening here. And part of the reason I say that, well, number one, is because we can see Simon is very impressed and wants to purchase that. Number two, when we get over to chapter 10, and we see that Peter is invited to the house of Cornelius, right? A centurion, a Roman. When he comes and he begins to, to speak to them and tell them about Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit falls upon all of those Gentiles standing there, and they began to speak in other tongues. See, God wants the apostles to know, if you're born a purebred Jew, if you're what you want to call a half-breed, half-Gentile, half-Jewish, half you're a Samaritan, or if you're fully Gentile, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you're born again. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. This is important for us on many levels. Certainly it's important in the whole topic, and we could talk about this some other time, of course, the whole topic of speaking in other tongues. But it's important for us in terms of, um, of understanding that God makes it clear that Jew, 
Gentile, Samaritan, are all in him. All are one in Christ. Well, there's a lot to look at here, but I would encourage you, read ahead, please, and spend time be between here and verse 40, 26 to 40, and study Philip's interaction with this Ethiopian, Ethiopian treasure. I think that if you really kind of search it out, you're going to be impressed. There's some really cool stuff that's going on here. Don't wait for me next week, but search it out for yourself, would you?